Welcome, welcome. As everybody finds their seats, we'll get started in just a minute. Everyone is very well behaved. I'm impressed at how little effort that took. Thank you. My name is Lauren Swartz, and I'm the President and CEO at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. We are an international affairs experience provider with over 70 years of expertise in creating connectivity for Philadelphia to the world. We offer speaker programs like this, youth education to over 85 middle and high schools. We have Bodine High School here with us today, some finance and international business students. We offer global travel, about 30 trips a year, and professional development to teach business people the art of cultural diplomacy. Excuse me. Today we're bringing you a program on crypto cryptocurrency in the world, a look at global regulation, security, and sustainability. This program and this discussion is made possible by our partnerships with members of the community like yourselves. In particular, we'd like to thank Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney, our lead partner on this program. Our host, the Racket Club of Philadelphia, and a cooperating organization, the Asian American Chamber of Commerce of Greater Philadelphia. Thank you all who are joining us today. We've got a few guests joining us online and all of you who've come to Center City today. There's a digital program book that you can take a look at to learn more about the council and learn more about our speakers. There's a QR code on the signs on your, on your table and you can also find it on our website. The format for today's conversation is relatively simple. We'll have a moderated discussion for a period of time and then we welcome your questions and we'll do our best to provide the right answers. We have a tradition of starting with a young person asking the first question. So one of our high school students from Bodine International High School will ask the first question. And I warn our panelists, the young, the young students, as Sarah and I were talking, she's with Wharton, always ask the hardest question. So it'll get easier from there, I promise. There's a buffet lunch in the background. As you see, please help yourself and make yourself comfortable. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator first. Sahel Asar is with Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney as an attorney, and she's been there since 2017. She's an, internet, she's an expert on international cross-border tax planning and chairs the firm's blockchain and crypto assets practice group. Welcome, Sahel. She's joined by three expert panelists today that come with different perspectives in different areas of work on crypto and the world. Next, we have Sarah Hammer from the Wharton School. She's the man managing director of the Stevens Center for Innovation in Finance. She's also the senior director of the Harris Alternative Investments Program at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Joining us virtually, we have Paul Hondius from the OECD. He's the head of the unit for harmful tax practices and a senior advisor for the exchange of information. Please bear with us if we have any technical difficulties. It looks like Paul is joining us successfully today. All of you know how difficult it is, no matter what plans you like, to zoom someone in from abroad. So thank you for your patience, and thank you, Paul. And last but certainly not least, we have James Haft. He's chairman of the board of a company called DLTX ASA, a company based in Norway. In your program books, you were expecting to meet Thomas Christensen, their CEO, a last minute change, but a welcome addition. We've got their chairman with us today. The company develops, operates, and supports the world's top blockchains. James has some very interesting ideas about sovereignty around crypto and a different perspective that we welcome here today. His experience as an entrepreneur in media, investing, M&A, and tech stars mentorship and all kinds of other things will be a welcome perspective. I look forward to this robust discussion on the regulatory frameworks and models around the world for digital currencies, to learn how the OECD is approaching tax compliance and unpacking the concerns around sustainability and energy cost. And more simply put, as we discussed when many of you were walking in, simply trying to better understand cryptocurrency, what it is, and how it's rapidly changing the world around us. Thank you for joining us today. Sahel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lauren. <coughs> so, I hope you can all hear me. I, th I think so. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today with uh, such an esteemed panelist. Thank you, Paul, for being with us from Paris. I just have a few opening remarks and I'm really going to moderate um, this terrific uh, panel. Um, as the chair of my firm's crypto asset and blockchain, uh, blockchain and crypto asset group, forgive me, 
I have a particularly interested and vested together with my firm about this space, which we think is really quite important. Crypto assets have grown substantially since Bitcoin was first um, introduced in 2009 and have since evolved in terms of several purposes and economic functions. Um, it reached a market capitalization of one billion in, in 2010 and since it's rose in, it, it rose to three trillion in 2021 and I think now it's down to one trillion, give or take a few wash sales that haven't been taken into consideration. And it promises um, a few use cases including financial services which I, which I know James is going to talk to us about as well as um, Sarah for remittance, trade financing, cross-border payments, as well as alternatives in uh, traditional finance. And across the globe, there have been different approaches in terms of how to handle this avalanche of technology and, and, and its applications. Um, and the approaches that, it's, that it has in terms of what that means, whether you advance innovation without stifling it, but also managing the risk and as well its challenges, which some of them are obviously the energy story. I think we need to reach a place where we have a regulatory framework that would provide legal certainty, effective risk monitoring, consumer protection, market integrity, and cross-border cooperation. And to that end, if I may turn to Sarah first, to my esteemed panelist, to present the uh, Wharton University of Pennsylvania's recommendation for a comprehensive approach to the regulation of digital assets, including the three pillars, which you will talk about. And I have three um, queries that I would like for you to comment. One is based on your perspective from Wharton uh, in terms of leading a corporate accelerator, which we'd love for you to tell us about, and what you see as the primary legal and regulatory challenges in, in making that um, a success. What is your estimation in terms of comprehensive digital assets regulation, given your, your, your particular um, vantage point? And how, how are you and your team sort of uh, making progress in that space? And finally, what research and work remains to continue to move towards a comprehensive cross-border regulation? Well, thank you so much, Sahal, for your leadership today. And I also want to say thank you to the World Affairs Council and Buchanan Ingersoll and Lauren uh, and to the Racquet Club for hosting us today. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here today. And I would also add, I am especially excited to see the students that are here today. I strongly encourage you to stay in touch. Uh, we do feel that young people are the future of finance and um, it's really neat, particularly in this area, to see the interest um, not only from a finance perspective, but also in terms of how blockchain technology can be applied to a lot of issues that we care about as a society. Um, so just to backtrack a bit, uh, one of the first things that you mentioned, Sahel, is our corporate accelerator. And I'll just give a brief overview of some of the things that we do at Wharton um, and that I have the privilege of working with many of our students on. Uh, we are responsible for research, education, thought leadership, and curriculum around blockchain and cryptocurrency, as well as other financial technologies that are non-blockchain related. And as part of that, we run a laboratory where I partner with Professor Brett Falk at the engineering school and a team of developers and law students to work on timely legal and research issues around blockchain and cryptocurrency. And then I also have the privilege of leading a team that created and brought to the world Cypher Blockchain Accelerator, which is our corporate accelerator uh, that actually will be opening up applications soon and this past spring scaled 10 leading companies in the blockchain space uh, that run the gamut across industries, across, um, across stage of company, and um, it's really been a privilege to work with them. So these companies are all applying blockchain technology in different ways. Uh, one, for example, is tokenizing real estate. Um, several have social impact focuses. There is, for example, an excellent financial identity company. Uh, there's a Web3 digital identity gaming company. One company that's actually using blockchain technology to manage um, surgical devices in the healthcare space. So you all may know that um, traditionally our way of managing the use of surgical devices has been antiquated, it's been paper-based, and using blockchain and smart contracts, for example, we can have a more efficient and better compliant system. So these are the kinds of companies that we have the privilege of working with. 
And uh, Cypher Accelerator is actually run by myself and a team of incredible graduate and undergraduate students. And we also have um, a large and wonderful group of senior advisors that uh, come from some of the leading venture capital firms in the world, and then a team of mentors who are executives who have already founded, scaled, and in some cases exited financial technology companies. So this um, accelerator is amazing, not only because it gives us educational opportunities, we are supporting the development of the technological ecosystem, um, but also because it gives us insight into what's really happening in blockchain and cryptocurrency. We run 60 workshops over a two month period. I have to tell you that's quite a sprint for the founders in our program and for us too. Um, and it's amazing because we get to work with so many incredible partners. Uh, so as part of this process, the research and running the accelerator and working with so many amazing people in the ecosystem, um, we are very aware of some of the regulatory issues around blockchain cryptocurrency. And um, many of the crypto native firms that we work with are deeply involved in some of those issues. So we're also very heavily engaged on the regulatory and the policy side. And again, I have some excellent research assistants who I work with um, who have helped me, for example, over the past summer to convene the federal financial regulators in private roundtable sessions. Uh, we work bilaterally with many of them. I recently hosted Chair uh, Rossi Benham uh, at the University of Pennsylvania for our opening event for the year to talk about cryptocurrency regulation, um, and that was quite a privilege. And next Monday, I, I invite everyone to join us uh, at noon. I'll actually be hosting Commissioner Pham and Commissioner Uyeda from uh, the SEC and the CFTC to talk about financial regulation and collaboration. So this should be an amazing event because, of course, one issue that's top of mind for many folks is how are those two markets regulators going to collaborate going forward in this space. So um, I don't wanna go on and on, but I'll quickly summarize uh, what we have recommended in terms of a comprehensive digital assets framework. And this is very high level, I'm happy to go into more detail, but really we see three important components. One is the industry. And there's always a tension between what happens in regulation and law and what's happening in industry, but in the crypto space, in the developer space, the advancement is so rapid and it's so complex that we strongly feel that having industry involvement in standard setting, smart contract standard setting, business practice standard setting is an essential piece, an essential pillar of our recommendations. The second is, of course, a strong federal consumer protection framework and regardless of which agency or agencies are uh, delineated to lead that, we think there are a number of important consumer protections that should be applied and there should be a federal interagency rulemaking process to provide for consistency. And then the third, uh, as I'm sure Paul will talk about today, is global standard setting and that's something that we're engaged in on as well. Wow. That's impressive. I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. <laughs> no, it, it, it just makes me want to talk to you for, for a lot more than what we have time for. Um, I might have a question later, but thank you for that very, um, uh, very um, concise summary. Um, Paul, speaking of uh, global standards and um, what the work of OECD may, I know that you've been very busy because you were on a call sort of laying out and we are the next uh, appointment for you today. So there's going to be uh, some interesting conversation, but um, central banks, regulatory authorities, and international setting bodies such as the OECD are looking more closely at establishing a workable framework such as what we call uh, in terms of a host of issues including the uh, anti-money laundering and FATF and some of the KYC that, that is um, so important in ensuring that we don't have, for lack of a better word, crypto shopping around the globe. And um, the, the availability of border standards with each country effectively having its own set of rules. And so to that end, um, could you give us your perspective with respect to, uh, if you could just describe what are the key features of CARF, the crypto asset reporting framework that the OECD has developed? How does it link to the anti-money laundering and the, the FAT guidance that's currently um, what is applied to virtual asset providers, and what are the next steps in terms of ensuring that CARF has 
um, consensus across the globe and also would be a viable option akin to some of the other guidance that the OECD has provided to date. Yes, thank you, Sir Helen. That's quite a, a task to answer that question in not too much of a lecture, which I'll try to avoid. I'll try to be concise because, of course, I'm very much looking forward uh, for to the discussion. And, 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 and in, in that regard, of course, also uh, a thank you from my end to uh, the World Affairs Council for uh, organizing this event and, of course, to Sahel and the other co-panelists for uh, discussing this topic together with me. Um, yes, well, the reason why I can't join you, unfortunately, in, in Philadelphia in person is because uh, in this week we are uh, here in Paris with uh, 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 representatives of over 140 countries to discuss the tax policy answers that we need uh, for the globalized world, and we are in the midst of that meeting, um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's good that it's 6 p.m. because that's the moment where I can then leave the physical space and go back in front of a screen to, to, to speak to you. Um, I think in a nutshell, uh, to answer your question, Sahel, why did we embark on this, world, uh, on this work at OECD level? I think that very much comes out of the uh, thought that uh, crypto has now left the avant-garde stage. And I think if you say that a certain a new development has left that stage, then I think you almost inevitably say that governments start looking at how to best regulate and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, enforce uh, compliance in such a sector. Um, and, and of course, there are many initiatives going on both at domestic and international level to make that happen. Uh, you have al already alluded to the regulatory initiatives that are being deployed, uh, not only in the United States, but also indeed at international level, probably most importantly, uh, the work that the Financial Action Task Force um, as the international standard setting body for anti-money laundering uh, purposes um, has done in relation to its uh, recommendations and guidance on uh, virtual asset service providers. Um, and, and, and very, very recently, I think those of you that follow this scene quite closely will have seen that the European Union um, earlier in the week came out with a uh, revised and now probably very close to final proposal on regulating crypto markets in Europe, uh, what, what we call the Mika regulation. Um, and so in that broader scheme of things, um, I think governments also increasingly felt the need uh, to ensure that um, tax authorities get access to information about uh, the holdings and uh, transfers that taxpayers do in crypto assets, of course, with the purpose being that um, everybody that realizes income from this income, uh, from this kind of activity can be taxed in accordance with the domestic laws of the country where uh, the person lives. Um, and of course, that there is also equal treatment between how income from uh, traditional financial markets would be taxed compared to how income that you would earn from crypto assets would be taxed. And so in that entire uh, context, we embarked about two years ago uh, on a project here at uh, OECD level with the backing of G20 countries um, to develop an international standard uh, for collecting um, and reporting information on crypto assets. And we are, in that sense, this uh, gathering that we have today is extremely timely because we are in the very, very, very final stages of releasing that uh, that work. Um, so I, I, I can already, I think, without having too much of a scoop, say that this will be relay, released next Monday um, and that you can also expect that there will be a G20 um, uh, position on this uh, communicated in the in the next week. Uh, to which, of course, we, we, we look, we look uh, uh, greatly forward in, in, in any event. And I think in a nutshell, what is our framework doing? Well, it is asking uh, crypto asset service providers that are um, tax resident incorporated or managed from a certain jurisdiction um, to provide uh, information to their local tax authorities about uh, the income and the identity of uh, taxpayers that have used the services of that crypto asset service provider that definition and kept, uh, ca captures uh, obviously trading platforms, um, but also other uh, persons offering services in the crypto asset sector, such as brokers, dealers, um, and also software providers that have control over a platform. That's of course of particular relevance in uh, what I would call the, uh, the, 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 the decentralized finance space that is not really decentralized. Uh, and, and, and many of the actors in that space operate in in, in, in that manner. 
And so all these actors, they will uh, report information on the identity and the income uh, of taxpayers to their local tax authority. And that tax authority will then exchange that information on an automatic and yearly basis with the countries uh, in which the taxpayers live. So very concretely, um, if an American taxpayer uh, would be using a UK uh, service provider to do transactions in crypto, uh, that information on the identity and the income of the American taxpayer would be reported to the UK tax authorities and the UK tax authorities would then make that available to the Internal Revenue Service on a yearly basis. And um, the idea that we have, and we hope that we can uh, indeed soon, soon announce things in this regard, is that this will really become a global product, so that will be consistently implemented across the globe. Uh, the United States has, from the very outset, always been very, very active um, through Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service in supporting this work. Um, and and uh, as I said, we, we uh, are, are, co are confident that we will see a widespread implementation in uh, the uh, coming years. Of course, there is still some technical work to be done, but I don't want to go into too much detail because I think that would not be very interesting for you, but I'm, of course, very happy to share any further details on uh, what the content of it is, but also the process, how we got there, and what, uh, what, what, what lies ahead in terms of making sure that this information starts flowing in the next years. Um, thank you for that, Paul. I, I think what you have mentioned is actually very important especially with respect to information reporting, because so many of our colleagues, I mean, not colleagues, but US persons um, have operations overseas and where there, has, there hasn't been reporting. Now that is going to be collected very similar to what FATCA had done in the past. So that's a very important piece of information. Thank you for sharing with us. And I'll be sure to call you after this event <laughs> to get further scoop as a tax professional. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, turning to James, um, so James, if you could comment, uh, I'd like to kind of pick your brain about proof of work, um, decentralized uh, technology and blockchain as well as, as well regulations, but how proof of work and the energy story is very important. You are an expert in terms of your views on sovereignty and uh, what that may or may not have some implications. Um, but recently, the US administration acknowledged uh, the role that Bitcoin's proof of work mining can play in benefiting the environment overall, especially with respect to power that comes from sources that are reducing method emissions from flare gas or from strained uh, renewable energy and, th and thus wind power, and, um, and how part of that would be helpful in terms of the grid stability and the like. So if you could comment on that in terms of help us understand these concepts, as well with respect to um, the Web3, uh, corporate and regulation benefiting Web3. When it comes to Web3, how is corporate adoption accelerating enterprises for cheaper and more robust alternatives to say the Amazon Web Services? I think that's very interesting. Um, and in this context, your company as chairman of DLTX are your focus on the three-tier data. Um, so what's Web3? How is it different from Amazon Web Services? And when will we get there? And as well, your views on decentralized future and how that's going to have an impact on how we know and see the world today. Thank you so much, Sahil. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll try to answer all that in five minutes or less. <laughs> so so um, uh, I want to start with a bigger view of what's going on right now. So uh, we're talking a lot about regulation, about crypto, about currencies, about politics, about sovereignty, right? And you know, the world and our governments are struggling to figure out how do we make this new thing look like the old thing so that the people who are already employed and doing things and have power can keep their current you know, income and maintain their position in power, which is what's really happening right here. And so you know, the, nation, the, the change over time happens because people have different ideas uh, and because they see the same thing differently than the people around them. And what's happening right now is the government's trying to figure out, you know, um, you know, everything's become political. So currency is political, right? We use the, the dollar as a political weapon against the Russians, right? We're gonna use it as a political weapon against the Chinese, 
and they know it, right? And so now that money is political, is that, does that change it? Does, it? does it change how you use it? Can, can you trust something that's by its nature political? And so, you know, what happened was, when, and so we listened to the regulations, that everything's very specific about how to keep order, how to keep everything the way it is, because it's really important that we don't rock the boat, right? Because we have a tax system, right? We have certain government services, we have two political parties, et cetera, right? Um, and so I like to tell a story about like, why is this happening today? Why is decentralization, whatever that is? Why is it happening now? Why is crypto, why is Bitcoin, right? And, and the way I look at it is over the last thousand years or more, humanity has been giving away rights in, order, in an exchange to, to get order out of chaos, right? So we created religion so that we could understand death and life and relationships, right? We created the monarchy so that we could start to have organized agriculture and, and you know, economy. We created the you know, fiat currency because it was really hard to carry around all that gold, right? Uh, and we wanted to do international exchange. We created the military to protect our boundaries. We corrected political states, which were shaped mostly by you know, terrestrial uh, you know, features over time, except when there's conflict. Um, and so we did this trade where we said, okay, I'll, I'll surrender this and I'll pay for this because I trust this centralized authority that I've created. I trust God, I trust the, the monarch, I trust the military, I trust the police, right? Uh, and then what happened is those entities that we trusted, that we created, they became political, they became self-aware. They started to realize they could only really exist if they had the support of the people. And so they, in the beginning, it was pandering, but then it became force, right? If you don't, if you don't do the right thing, you're, you're gonna get excommunicated, you'll never see God, right? If you don't do the right thing, I'm gonna throw you in jail, I'm gonna send my military after you, I'm gonna take away your wages, I'm gonna, all these different things which are really based unfortunately on coercion and, and violence, right? How do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you comply. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like 2001 Space Odyssey, right? There's that great scene where the computer's supposed to protect the mission, and it, there was always the assumption the mission was the astronauts, right? And then it gets to a point where the machine realizes, wait a minute, the astronauts are turning against me, something's not going right, I don't, I'm feeling uncomfortable, and it's like, you know, open the pod bay door, Hal, and Hal says, you know, Dave, I don't think I could do that, right? So, you know, that's where we are right now. That's where our, we are with our government and all these centralized authorities is we're looking at it going, okay, we like order. We like, you know, the, the social contract. We like the way this has worked so far. America's beautiful because of democracy, et cetera. Uh, but now we're kind of getting to a point where, wait a minute, you know, is this really working the way we expected? And do these centralized authorities actually represent me as an individual? Right? Am I really being represented now? If I'm Russian and I'm watching what's happening in the Ukraine, you may have one or two different opinions in a room, right? Uh, and so how do, you, how do you deal with that? And so Bitcoin and decentralization, they're not things that are coming that are changing humanity. It's that humanity is looking for a new answer. How do I communicate with my friends, you know, the people of like mind with me in Palestine or in, or in Russia when I'm an American today? And how do I choose which side I'm on instead of having my government choose for me which side I'm on, right? And that's what, and so when you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is about the hegemony of the dollar politically over individuals. And do you really own that dollar? Is it really yours? Like I've had situations where I've tried to, you know, uh, to transfer money and I was told by the, by the bank, sorry, you can't do that. You know, you need more documentation. You need more X, Y, Z. And it's always worked out. Uh, but at the end of the day, it makes you think, you know, wow, is that my money, right? Even though it's there, it has my name on it, but some guy's telling me from a black room, the Wizard of Oz, that I can't, I can't move it. So, you know, I think that when we look at what's happening now, we need to listen to, yes, the need for order, which makes sense. And I can now address point, proof of work and currency and, all the, and Web3 in that, in that context. And if you, if you look at them, they're, they're all the same, right? These are all things which are being brought about which are different than what was done before, which is either evolutionary or revolutionary to change to address what the needs are of humans 
right now in our current situation, right? So Web3 um, is, the, is the next iteration in how people communicate with each other on, uh, you know, on a network, as a, in a global network. And Web3 is, uh, in its purest form, not bound by, by national boundaries. Uh, and it's the ability for individuals to have peer-to-peer -peer relationships and to transact them without the need of the approval or the certification of a third-party independent authority. So you don't need a lawyer, bank, or an accountant, uh, because historically we looked at the, we took information and we put it in silos. We patented it. And we made the advantage of a corporation though that information that corporation has that nobody else has. So you were defending your walled, your, 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 your walled castle with a moat around it because you had com you know, competitive secrets. Can I ask you just very quickly, sure. how, if, if I wanted to have a Web3 address, mm -hmm. very quickly, how do I do that? So Web3 is not, a, it is not a actual web. Web3 uh, relies on the existing internet. Uh, so there's no different than the, that's one of the things that's different in this new world of, of distributed ledger technology, in that everything is digitized and, and transmitted around the world on the same system as everything else. Uh, the only difference is that in Web3, your communications are encrypted, and you choose where your information goes. You choose who can see your information, uh, and, and there's no third party that is that that steps between you and the transaction. So if, for instance, it, since everything's on an open ledger, everybody can see everything. I can see your wallet, you can see mine. If I want to do a transaction with you in Web3, I don't go to ask your lawyer to write a letter and have your, your accountant give me a, you know, pers you know, numbers and, 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 and go through this process with bankers. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of different filters that information goes through before you get it. Instead, I say, Sahil, show me your wallet. And you give me an address, and I look at that wallet, and either the asset that you're representing to me is there, or it's not, period. There's no third party, there's no transparency. It's zero or one, okay, it's binary. And then I'll say, how do I know you, that you control that wallet? Send me a test transaction. Send me one one thousandth of, of something to show me that you can move your asset from your wallet to my wallet. And once you've done that, I know, in fact, you control that wallet, right? And so now I can do a transaction where we have a smart contract that says, I'll give you X because I've shown you that I have it. And you'll transfer, and the smart contract is X for Y when I push the button. And that, right? makes, and that makes Paul's world very, very complex because now you have to come up, Paul, with a new series of rules to understand how that transaction can be. Well, I think, I, think in the, I think in the short run I, I, that you know, people need to try and save the current system. How do we make sure everything's taxed? How do we make sure everything's recorded? In the future, these things might change. I mean, it's easy to forget that there was a, post, there was a postal service and there was garbage collection before there was taxes, mm -hmm. right? So these things can happen in a different environment with different relationships. You know, it just takes, may take time to transmit. And on the decent and your view on the, de the sort of decentralized and blockchain in the future. I mean, I think this is how we protect ourselves. So, uh, so my company is the uh, was the first and probably one of the only uh, publicly listed companies that does business primarily with blockchains. So our counterparts in our transactions are not people, uh, and they're not corporations, and they don't have self-interest. They have algorithmic understandings that are published. So when I start a transaction with a blockchain, I know what the response is. It is literally a mathematical equation that is broadcast and publicly available. So if I, for instance, we are one of the largest miners of Filecoin in the United States. Filecoin is distributed uh, memory, distributed storage, uh, so that you control your storage. If you remember during the last election cycle, there were a bunch of right wing uh, uh, mouthpiece uh, websites like Parler, et cetera, that were shut down by AWS, by Amazon. And it's funny because it was actually during the Republican, you know, during, the, during a Republican administration, uh, but somebody sent the message to Amazon, you should shut off these servers. They're telling lies. They're bad for America, right? And, uh, and Amazon shut them down. And those companies went out of business overnight, immediately, 
right? And so now, if you're the head of Chase Manhattan Bank, or well, that's the wrong name now, but J.P. Morgan, I guess, uh, or, or you're the, you know, uh, the, the president of El Salvador, right? Or you, or you work at, at, at or an, any other individual that has information, you now know that if you keep your information in the cloud, at AWS, Azure, Google, that you don't really own that data, right? That data is owned by a guy who can turn the switch and, 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 and separate you from your data. So we believe that over time, people will be moving their data to be treated the same way Bitcoin is treated, which is protected by a cryptographic key and distributed globally so that only you can access it and that you maintain control of it over time. And we think that that's actually gonna become a, that it's gonna become obvious that you must do this. So we're trying to be ahead of that curve. Uh, we, we mine Filecoin, we create, we participate in the global system that offers distributed, safe, secure, self-sovereign data globally. Uh, but we know how do we get incentivized to do this? This is still a business. We're publicly listed. And so what we do is the, is the algorithm tells you if you produce memory over time that's reliable, you'll get paid X. So we put, you know, or you'll get paid, you know, a multiple of what you've put in according to a formula. So we put in basically one file coin in, we lock up a terabyte of data, and we receive back two, two file coins for the service. Right? So now I know when I employ a, a, you know, a, fi a, a fill, the, the native coin for Filecoin, when I deploy one into the system, I know over time I'm going to get roughly two back. So I can run a business off that margin. And so our business is actually the arbitrage between what would cost us to produce the tokens, which is a service, and what people will pay for that service on the back end, or what the protocol would pay us on the back end. So the last thought that we want, we would appreciate your commenting on is also with so Bitcoin and the um, energy story and the proof of work and how that's going to actually help the environment. Supposedly. Well, it's, in it's interesting. You know, again, there's people who uh, are have have ingrained interests in the in the energy world, right? And they don't want things to change. For a while, the big oil producers were against uh, renewables. They were against wind power. They were against you know uh, hydro because you know, hydros, because carbons will be here forever, right? Um, what's happening in the, in the proof of work, work world is that there's been a characterization that Bitcoin and that, that then throw the baby out with the bathwater, all crypto just burns electricity and ruins the, the environment. First of all, almost all cryptocurrency right now is mined using renewable energy. And certainly almost you know, more than 90% of future expected uh, mining of crypto will be again around renewable. And so what's actually happening, if you look under the hood, is that crypto is becoming the raison d'etre for the move away from, hydro from, from hydrocarbons. Uh, because the biggest problem in building a power system is that you can't just build one number of production because it doesn't run smoothly unless you have batteries, which is why Elon Musk is focusing on it. So basically you need to focus for you know, the, the, the average load, but you really need to focus on the peak load because it's the peaks that blow out the systems that cause, the, you know, that, that cause all the horrific problems within the, within the power grid. And so you need to find a way to, to, to finance energy so that you can be economically viable producing the base load, but also have produced 2x so you actually have the ability to serve the peak, even though the peak only comes for two days a, you know, a year. And what, it turns out that crypto is perfect for that because you can turn on and off a server overnight, or, or actually in a, in a millisecond. And so most of the power contracts now that are coming into being for, for crypto actually are focused more on curtailment services, which means basically the ability to fund that extra layer that's needed to meet peak so that, you're, so that you can actually sell that electricity or profit in the production of crypto as, as, the, as the power producer. Uh, and so you're, vi so, so you're financially viable at base load and you can tell the producers of crypto, shut off your machines instantaneously when you have the peak loads. So now you have actually the ability to finance the growth of energy, use renewables and produce you know, in excess of base load so that you can run, so you can run peak. And I'm, not, you know, I'm an art history major, so uh, I'm sure people understand some of this better than I do. Uh, but, the, you know, but I think that, again, this is just a way that the conversation is being skewed uh, away from the reality. You know, just like they, they said that the, that, the, that the blackouts in Texas 
two, three years ago was based on renewables because 10% of, the, you know, of, of the, the wind farms represent 10%, you know, had a problem and that brought the grid down. I mean, that story didn't hold water for very long, right? <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's remarkable how much we can talk about this at, at length, but um, to be respectful of everyone's time and also to ask the queries. I have a bunch of questions which I'm going to reserve also to, to Sarah, but um, I'd like to turn to the audience. And as it's traditional, the first question we will take from um, the, um, the folks at Bodine, uh, Naila Abbasi. You have, the mic is yours. I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, my name is Naila Abazi. I am a senior at uh, Bodine High School of International Affairs. And my question is, what are the negative impacts that cryptocurrency platforms will be facing if a comprehensive global regulatory policy takes place? Oh, I think that's, that one's for, for you, Sarah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that question, Naila. I think it's an excellent question. And I just want to... Um, add a distinction, uh, which may, many of you may already be aware of, but I want to make sure it doesn't get lost in our conversation, which is that there is a difference between blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. So blockchain technology is the technology that powers cryptocurrency, and it came to um, operation with the invention of Bitcoin or the emergence of Bitcoin in 2008. So that technology, which is essentially a decentralized way of managing data and validating transactions, which has many potentially positive attributes, like a higher level of security, immutability, offering a provenance from a legal perspective, is different from cryptocurrency itself. And blockchain can power not just cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin and Ethereum and Dogecoin and whatever else, um, you know, tens of thousands of cryptocurrencies that are out there, but also it can be used for things like the companies that I spoke about earlier, managing healthcare data, for example, or even managing clean energy data. Um, we have worked with a company that's actually using blockchain to help individuals offer their own data for analysis to determine the most efficient use of data because our energy usage data is protected by privacy laws. So those are really two different things, and we are focused at Wharton um, and the University of Pennsylvania on the technology, as well as cryptocurrency, but we're, we're not so much in the crypto trading space as we are looking at the whole ecosystem and how the technology evolves. And certainly the two are integrally connected. Um, the way I look at the regulatory regime um, is that I think that there will be many positive attributes that come as we achieve clarity. So if I'm an entrepreneur, it's very difficult for me to make decisions about how to run my business if I do not know what the law is. And although it might seem like if there were no laws that are applicable, I could do whatever I want, it actually creates a lot of business uncertainty and a lot of risk that makes it more difficult to become a profitable business over time. Um, that said, there's a lot of work to be done in the crypto space, and we've barely touched the surface in our conversation today, not only in tax and money laundering and the issues I mentioned around securities law and consumer protection, um, but there are issues around bankruptcy, protection of customer assets, um, and um, a lot of these issues are going to take a lot of time and a lot of collaboration and agreement by policymakers around the world. Paul, would you like to weigh in? Do you have comments to that? Did you hear the question? Yes, I certainly did. I mean, maybe maybe just to add that I think it is uh, um, in inherent, also maybe reacting to 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 to, to part of the uh, discussions that we had in the panel earlier on. I think it's 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 inherent in. Uh, I would say it's almost the tragedy of democracy that on the one hand you want to allow uh, freedom uh, to develop new answers and new solutions and new projects. And that's, of course, something that I think we all in democracies attach great value to, that people can strive and be creative and innovative. And at the same, uh, at, at the same time, we, of course, need to make sure that we can also live together and so that we have common rules to play along and that uh, we get legitimization for uh, the way in which uh, business is run and the way, in the way which government is run. And it's always a difficult balance, of course, but I think um, the, the initiatives that we are deploying are, 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 
are, are really doing an, uh, a genuine effort and it's not always easy to balance that out, certainly not in the global setting, uh, to, to, to get that, that, that mix between, between allowing innovation to continue and on the other hand, having a reliable, consistent, measured uh, regulatory framework uh, for this sector in place. And of course, it's a very different route compared to the route that certain other countries have taken that have just outrightly prohibited crypto assets, for instance. Um, I, think, I think we are quite far away in terms of the way we look at this, this development from, from that. But, but, but of course, it, um, it, it, it needs to uh, uh, also fit in the, in the broader way in which we would like to live together, where, of course, I think there's also a legitimate expectation uh, from those that maybe have less of a voice um, that they are protected against um, behaviors that might take away the savings that they have accumulated or uh, in, in, in indeed of course also um, create create disparities of, of means and possibilities that we that we that we would not want to live with and of course ideally I think a, a fair taxation system also reflects that um, that it strikes a balance between uh, leaving as much wealth in the hands of people that have earned it uh, while at the same time making sure that that, that, that those that need it most get it. And that's of course uh, always a struggle to get that balance right and ideas are, are fluctuating on that. But I, I would think that at least certainly of course in the OECD community, we all attach a very strong uh, um, value to, uh, to, to the democratic way of doing things as, as I think uh, Winston Churchill said it quite eloquently the, the least worst of all possible ways of, of, of living together uh, with all its imperfections, of course, over time. Very elegant. James? Um, uh, I think that, that the, the issue brought around by trying to have global legislation, first of all, global legislation hasn't worked for anything else in the past. I don't know why it would work for crypto. Um, it's kind of, I think it's odd as a goal. Um, I think that the, um, the problem is that that would tend towards a system where you're forcing people to comply. Because how do you get to the average? How do you get to the family that has actually 2.5 children, right? It just doesn't exist. So um, I think that crypto is going to be crypto or distributed. It's not, it shouldn't be crypto. I agree with you, uh, Sarah. It should be distributed ledger, businesses based on distributed ledger technology, which is actually the underlying technology of blockchains uh, and that there are other forms other than blockchains of distributed ledger. There's, there's DAGs and you know, other there's sharding. There's other ways you can move forward other than blockchains themselves. Um, but the, uh, the system, I think that the whole distributed ledger open source, open system type of, uh, of opportunities for people to communicate with each other are going to force the existing governments to change over time. And this is actually going to be very positive, where everyone's worried about you know, revolution and, and violence, et cetera. I think that the way that our political nations, our political states are run is going to have to change to start to listen to people more, because people are going to have alternatives. And so to keep people inside the system, our tax system really is based on you know, voluntary compliance mostly. You know, most people just pay their taxes. Most people pay their parking tickets. They do what they're supposed to do because they want to make the social contract. They want to be part of the, of the community. And I think that having other ways to communicate and other ways to invest and other ways to profit and, and relate with each other is going to force the way that our governments to be, to try and find ways to build systems that people will volunteer into as opposed to being forced to comply. And I think that's going to be very positive for us. And I look forward to that. Terrific. Well, I'd like to now turn to the audience. And um, if you have any queries, please raise your hand. Someone will bring a microphone to you. And to those who are uh, viewing this online uh, virtually, please go ahead and um, put your uh, query in the chat box. And someone will bring that to our attention. Please. I have a question from an estate planning perspective. This uh, cryptocurrency is treated like an asset. So if the person who has the cryptocurrency were to die, it's complete privacy that exists. What happens to that asset? It's a very interesting question. Um, 
Yeah. There's a lot of estate planning, gift tax, and, and that's a, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to respond to that uh, initially. I think it's, it's a, um, a concern that is on, on most of the estate planners' minds, and particularly um, more and more we're, ha we're seeing that we are advising our clients in terms of amending their wills and trusts and, and sort of all of their sort of um, uh, planning documentation to reflect to the extent they have cryptocurrencies how to manage those, but at the end of the day, it's a real problem because uh, cryptography, the whole point of it is that there is uh, anonymity, there is privacy, and unless you were to exactly communicate it, um, very, it's not going to be revealed. And so um, with technology comes some drawbacks, and this happens to be one of them. And I think that um, states around the country are sort of grappling with that very issue both in terms of privacy, but also in terms of taxation, in terms of transfer and the like, and as well in terms of a lot of the trust companies that are holding on to some of these assets. So, but that's my point of view from a tax point of view. If, if um, Sarah, you'd, you'd like to comment? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I'm not focused on estate planning, but of course I, you're I not. think well, I, <laughs> we- um... you, you're not, You didn't do that since this morning. <laughs> Um, but you, you, uh, some, of, some of you may have heard there are certainly instances where um, unfortunately someone has gone missing or passed away and the private key um, to uh, access a cryptocurrency digital wallet has been unavailable. So that, that is what I would add at an extremely high level that certainly delineating and specifying in your trust and estate makes sense, but again, I'm not a trust and estate yeah. attorney. And no, that's absolutely right. And to, and to that point where, you know, there's, it's also a matter of losing your keys. So you could, you know, you pass away, but there's also um, instances where you have a number of crypto assets and you've secured it somewhere and you can't remember it. And we also have, you know, instances where whether it's, um, you deterioration of the mind or just a situation where you have lost where you've secured your keys. So communicating that is actually very, very important. And it comes back to the idea that whilst we don't want to have, or the whole point of um, these types of assets is to relinquish the trusted inter intermediary that you, you, know, you can't live in a vacuum either. There has to be some sort of communication. So. I think that question was probably mine, ironically. We do have a question from online. Uh, Chip Cope asks, James, in your view, is blockchain necessary for Web3? And if you're predicting the future, which blockchain or chains would Web3 be built on? Is it built on a decentralized storage blockchain like Filecoin or Arweave? or does it roll up into a layer one, like Ethereum or even Bitcoin? Interesting. Uh, what was the first part of the question, quickly, just? Sure, in, um, in your view, is yeah. blockchain necessary for Web3? Okay, so the answer is um, that uh, uh, some form of distributed ledger uh, solution is required. Um, and if you want to learn more, my partner in my business, the, one of the, my co-founders, his name is David Johnston, uh, he wrote something called the decentralized theory, uh, the, the, the general theory of decentralized applications, which was a white paper written in 2013 before Ethereum existed, uh, which basically outlined what a de why you need decentralized applications if you're going to have a decentralized platform. Uh, and his four rules there were you have to be based on open source software, you have to be tokenized, you have to be governed by the tokens, and you have to distribute the value of the activity generated back to the token holders as incentive. Uh, so that's actually the, the working definition now of a Web3 DAP today. Uh, and so, yes, there's no other technology that can offer self-sovereignty and protection for peer-to-peer -peer transactions other than blockchains today. Uh, and in terms of uh, platforms, I don't do prognostication on platforms. Uh, I think that, that uh, we're so early uh, in, you know, in what's happening that it, it would be so it'd be presumptuous to think I even know what blockchains would be in existence in three to five years from now. 
So on that, if I may follow up on that, when you say we're so early, and I think it's really to the panel, when do you think we will actually reach a level of uh, you know, adoption and consensus that would be, how far out are we? How early in the game are we? And what's the horizon in your, in your estimation? Well, um, the world's not made of one big, you know, homogenous community. So there are certain communities where it's already at 99.9%, .9%, you know, and people, you know, are living in this world and, and heading towards it. Um, the thing about, if we just take the, the question more general, the when's mass adoption, when's mass right. adoption, right? Mm -hmm. Mass adoption is gonna be based on the finding of a killer application, okay? You don't care about technology. You don't care about how things work. You don't know how your phone works. You don't know how your TV works. You don't know how your car works. You don't know how an airplane works, it just works. right? It just works. You get in, you do it, you have a level of trust, right? And so what it's about is a killer app. And we really don't have a killer app yet. And people, some people would say Bitcoin, I'm not sure that, you know, Bitcoin's interesting, I, I do, I, I am a proponent, but I'm not sure it's the killer app. It is the first working example that got mass adoption, all right? Um, you know, and so I think that you gotta wait to the, to the point where you can look at your phone, press some buttons, have some lights change, and not need to know that it is blockchain. You just need to know that you're drawn to the characteristics of this experience, and that that experience factually will only be able to be delivered today by blockchain, the sharing of, of you know, the peer-to-peer -peer relationship, the sharing of the benefits with the token holders, the open, you know, the open sharing of information. So when it's driven by, the, by faster, cheaper, more secure, more scalable, as opposed to this one's Avalanche or this one's Ethereum, because you know what? I'm the chairman of a public company that does this stuff, and I couldn't tell you the difference you know, if, I, if I got to a granular level. So that's, nev that's never gonna be the, the gating. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, so, I don't have a, uh, if I knew when mass adoption was going to take place, <laughs> I'd be omniscient. I would say one thing that we have found interesting was um, in studying the crypto crash that took place earlier this year, um, how different entities have responded to that. And uh, certainly there are many problematic um, dynamics that emerged during the crypto crash and um, perhaps a better understanding of some of the um, challenges and some of the tensions in the industry around the law, around business practices, around how limited terms of service work in the crypto space. But from our conversations and our collaborations with corporate partners, um, our understanding is that many of the incumbent financial institutions that are using mm -hmm. blockchain technology or um, looking at uh, stable coins, for example, for different mechanisms like clearing and settling, um, not only in the US but abroad, are moving forward um, mm -hmm. with determination. And so I don't think that there, uh, to our knowledge, we have not seen a change in big picture meta strategy um, on that front. And I, I think that that goes to show that the underlying technology itself of blockchain has some attributes which can be very attractive to financial services. I would add, the reason I originally became interested in blockchain uh, is because I uh, started my career as a derivatives trader. And um, in working in the trading space or in portfolio management, for example, um, the process of clearing and settling a trade um, between two banks, for example, can take two days and um, it's a very unwieldy process, even with our existing technology. So that creates uh, systemic risk. And that means you have counterparty risk. Um, it means that there's a greater amount of risk in the system than there needs to be. Um, it's inefficient. And in 2010, when we enacted Dodd-Frank, um, I'm sure you know that we designated central clearing counterparties to manage that process for us, but in many ways that was one could argue that that is a concentration of risk rather than a reduction of risk. So the, you know, there are certainly different views on that. And the reason I found blockchain technology interesting is because it has the potential to help us clear and settle trades within minutes. Right. And um, I think that that understanding of the technology combined with the potential for provenance, which is tracking an asset and the attributes of that asset and the details of a transaction over time in an immutable or permanent way is really very interesting. And it's not only for clearing and settling 
in the financial sector, but also, for example, in payments. So when I Venmo you, it seems like you get that money right away, but it actually can take up to two days to clear and settle that transaction. And these are the things that I think are very interesting about the distributed ledger technology um, that will, will have potentially more lasting effect. We share that passion, Sarah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> any other question? Any other questions from the audience? I think we have two, we have one here and then one there. We have three more. If I can have the young lady start with yours. Hi, my name is Juadia and I am a senior at Crystal Ray Philadelphia High School and I'm also a work study and student intern at the World Affairs Council. Um, we saw in the news this week another high profile instance of a celebrity influencer being fined for not disclosing on Instagram how much she was paid by a crypto company. Why is it important for influencers or celebrities to disclose this information for their followers? And what are the dangers of them not doing so? That's a very interesting question. So, um, <laughs> boy, no. smart. I can, I'll take, I'll answer. You'll take that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, what's happening is the government doesn't know how to regulate this new thing uh, and so one of the one of the pressures is to regulate it as a security a security is a very specific thing it's not something which comes out of nature it's it's an it's an as it's a concept which is defined by people uh, in laws that change um, and so what you have now is a, is the Securities Exchange Commission who are very anxious to make sure this new thing comes under their purview because their business is to manage these financial institutions which could be replaced by this new technology, by this new concept. Um, and so what's happening is that the government doesn't know what to do yet. There isn't a single voice. They don't have an answer. And when the government's working, uh, trying to figure out, their, make up their mind, what they've learned is that the more that they say during the interim period, the less ability they have to enforce later because then people can say they relied on government statements, and that becomes a defense. And so what's happening right now is the government is doing what's called, uh, le they're legislating or, 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 or uh, regulating uh, by example, instead of actually having a rule that you could follow. Because the US legal system, especially for securities and financial transactions, is really more based on safe harbors than it is on actual rules. It's like, if I follow these rules, then I'm safe. I will not be pursued, I won't be taxed, I won't be, I won't be prosecuted. And so what they're doing is they're not yet ready to tell you what you need to do to be protected. But instead what they're doing is they're, is they're relying on other things like fraud uh, or misrepresentation. And they're tying those in saying, obviously that's bad, right? And one of the rules for misrepresentation in securities is you have to declare when you're being compensated. So if it's a security and it falls under securities laws, if you're making money on a transaction or a recommendation, you actually have a responsibility under the regulations to A, be eligible to receive the, the, the payment, which you're not unless you're a broker dealer, right? Again, a, a securities concept. And B, you, if, you know, if you're a broker dealer, you must disclose how you're getting paid because those are the securities laws. And morally, it's probably right for you to say it also. I'll throw in there. Uh, but that's really, I think, what's happening right now. Um, I, th I, I mean, think, maybe I think if, you I, found if your I can. Future a, intern yeah. as for yeah. investor exactly. relations. Come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> okay, we, yes. we can take uh, one more question, uh, and I think we're coming sorry, down the sorry, wire. Sarah, if, I can, if, I, if I can maybe, I don't know if, I, if you can hear me from. Maybe not. The, the microphone, I think, is coming to you. The gentleman right there in the middle with the, yeah. Did you want to raise this up or not? Uh, my name is Stephen Medvick, longtime member of the World Affairs Council. I'm a professor of political science at Holy Family University in Torresdale. Um, and I also, uh, I would say, have a fairly good grasp of economic issues. Uh, this. Actually, my questions have in many ways been answered already. I was going to pose a question about the Kim Kardashian case, but I think you answered it very well. I think the uh, issue about the regulation 
Uh, one of the things I would like you to say, all of you, is you said this uh, came about in 2008, 2009, but you didn't say whose idea it was, how it came about, who jumped onto the bandwagon, who stayed off the bandwagon. None of that has been enunciated so far. But I guess my real question, this also goes to our a gentleman from Paris, OECD. How do governments, the United States Treasury Department, the Japanese bank in Tokyo with the yen, uh, the euro in, in Frankfurt, not to mention the kroner in Sweden, the, the pound in Great Britain, strong currencies in the world, or lesser ones such as in, say, Zimbabwe, how do they really react to this? We talked about taxation. Uh, that would have been another question. It's not been fully rectified, sort of how the Congress in this nation state deals with immigration. It doesn't want to deal with immigration. Uh, they don't want to go near it for various uh, political and or other reasons. But what is, I guess now my question, what is uh, not only the historical question of 2008-2009 foundation of cryptocurrency, who were the founding fathers, if you will, or mothers, but also what is the reaction of central banks, of the U.S. Department of the Treasury? Do they view this as a threat to their own sovereign currency, for example, the U.S. dollar, the Canadian dollar, let's not forget them, the euro, the yen, or weaker currencies such as in Zimbabwe? Thank you. Um, I think I can take a quick crack at it. Um, your, your question is, um, is a very good one, and it's a highly comprehensive one. I mean, we can probably talk for a long time about it. And part of the reason why we really didn't get into how or why we got into this, the who created Bitcoin and some of the historical context is that we probably maybe thought that most of the audience was well-versed as you are. Uh, there's a book called Digital Gold, which I, I suspect you may have heard of. Um, and it's, uh, it's a good place to start in terms of a historical context. But my answer, and then I'd love to hear from Paul, is that having studied and being very close to understanding uh, how central banks, um, what their view is, and, 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 and the fact that really during the 2008 crash, this sort of perpetrated to, to the forefront and Bitcoin was sort of born or, or brought more to the to the mainstream's attention, I, my, my sense is that central banks are still trying to assess, and everything that you've mentioned um, is fair play. There is some, some concern, there is some risk, there's some fear, and it's a, you know, for, first the, the, the comments or the reaction was, well, this is just nonsense and it's just gonna go away. It hasn't gone away. It's gone up to three trillion, it's come down to one trillion. Paul has just spent uh, the last couple of months you know, assessing an entire framework that the OECD is going to, to address, and central banks around the world are all sitting around and trying to figure out what this means for the Swiss franc, for the yen, for this or that. So I think, I think we, it's still early days, and I don't think that there's going to be a, um, not, a, not a reaction to it, but I think that it's, um, it's a work in progress. I'd love to hear from the panel because I think it's very important. And, Paul, if you, if you may comment and then follow it with your closing comments, and then Sarah, and then have James as well, that'd be terrific. Yes, thank you, Sahel. Um, I, I mean, maybe, maybe before uh, answering the, 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 the question, uh, also a brief reaction on the, on the disclosure of Instagram, uh, on this Instagram case. I mean, I think, I think it also goes to the heart of what I, what I said earlier in my in my interventions as well, which is maybe another perspective on this question. And I think you know one of the important uh, fundamental pillars on which we build democratic societies is that we are open towards each other in public life, what our interests are. And um, I think you see that reflected in, um, in 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 many ways. I think it would be very different if I would pretend that I would just be a private citizen in this panel and not disclose that I'm part of the OECD, which is an international organization in the tax policy arena, and that's of course relevant information. And similarly, if somebody gets paid for uh, uh, saying something in public, 
um, that is something that, you know, the people that are the recipients of that message have a right to know, of course, why that person is saying that particular message and how that might be influenced. I think that is a very important way in which we, uh, inter of, of, the, of, the, of the fundamentals of how we interact with each other, why we have job titles, why we have professions, why we have uh, disclose our, 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 our interests that we might have in a certain, uh, in a certain matter. Um, and I think that's part of, of, of fair democratic debate that you that you are transparent about who has financed you and for whom you are speaking. And so I think that is that is certainly something that I think is, is part of this bigger discussion of how do we want to interact with each other in a in a civilized society. But maybe on the question uh, briefly, and then I'll conclude on, on the question of how do central banks uh, deal with this. I think that's indeed a very relevant question. I think you, if, if you see what the tendencies are um, of, 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 of incorporating um, uh, central bank digital currencies as, as, a, as a form of, 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 of crypto uh, in, into, into uh, the, the broader uh, spectrum of, of how money is issued by, by central banks. I see that there, I think you can certainly see that there are certain uh, interests in terms of making use of the, of the ad additional opportunities that this technology offers for uh, allowing uh, uh, citizens to uh, to 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 uh, uh, manage their money and 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 to and, and to transact with each other um, in 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 fiat currency, I think it's at the same time fair to say, and we have numerous examples of that, including in recent history, that also I think governments have a strong appreciation that um, financial systems can be very uh, volatile, and that it's always that there are always risks in terms of when bigger shocks come into the financial system in terms of what that means for the overall stability. And so I think there is certain, certainly a, also an appreciation that we have seen with a no number of central banks that any initiatives of integrating crypto into the uh, fiat currency system, that they are always quite limited in scale at the moment, because I think there are, there are concerns for, uh, for the overall monetary stability, if you would uh, do, a, do a sort of shock effect there and take the entire way the current financial system with financing and refinancing uh, amongst banks and with the central bank, uh, if you would significantly disrupt that. So I think in general, there seems to be across the board uh, of many countries an interest in, in seeing what crypto can mean for uh, making uh, the fiat currency system uh, 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 better and, and, and bring innovation. And I think there, that, that there are, as I said, many initiatives, but it's certainly something that, that I think that's fair to say that is, that is of course, seen with some prudence um, um, a, a, as well. Um, and so maybe maybe to, 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 to conclude, uh, I also see that the time is progressing now, from my perspective. I mean, I, I, I certainly think that uh, there is a task for, um, um, for uh, the global community uh, to try to come up with with uh, answers that are, uh, on the one hand, making sure that that the benefits of of, of distributed ledger and of, of crypto um, can be used by by everybody that wants to uh, use this as an as an as an asset class to 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 invest, to maintain wealth, to increase wealth, uh, but that at the same time uh, those phenomena that we would not want to see, such as um, criminal behaviors, um, money laundering, organized crime. Um, and of course, also people that want to take away other other people's money uh, through poorly regulated uh, financial instruments. That that's something that we uh, that we that, that we of course would not like to see. And I think it's as I said, I think the the, the what we are searching for uh, at the moment uh, is is to find the right balance. And I'm sure that we're not there yet. It's all one step at a time. Um, and and I, I can certainly tell you that, and uh, you'll probably know that uh, from from international affairs in general, that multilateral negotiations are extremely painful. They require a lot of compromise. Uh, they they require a good spirit. But I think uh, also, you know, in the broader set of things of where we are in the in the world, it is still far better than uh, something that is not based on rules and not based on negotiations, because the kind of things that you get into then are certainly not better. Sarah, closing comments? Well, I think Paul said it very well, so I don't have a lot to add. I uh, appreciate his remarks. And I would um, add that uh, for clarification on the US's position, one can simply look to the recent reports that were issued by United States Treasury. So in March, uh, President Biden issued an executive order That's on right. digital assets and uh, ordered 21 reports across the federal government to be conducted around digital assets. Many of those reports have been released. If you would like to uh, see a summary 
uh, tracking and finding those reports, it can actually be found on uh, our research assistance page on the Social Science Research Network. Globally, far be it for us to try to cover the complexity in this conversation, but certainly there's a very diverse approach to um, crypto and blockchain around the world, ranging from uh, places like Singapore, where there's a sandbox and a ban on retail advertising, to a more thorough set of rules in the EU and in right. Dubai, for example. Um, I guess one other distinction I would make is that when it comes to central bank digital currency, uh, there are many countries around the world that are exploring and even implementing central bank digital currency. But CBDC can be built on blockchain or not on blockchain. And in fact, there are many countries that are building CBDC not on blockchain. And certainly in the US, it's something that we're exploring. But it's not just a cryptocurrency issue. It's also a financial inclusion issue for many. And so one has to explore whether digitizing a currency would actually be more inclusive and how do we reach the people who don't actually have access sure. to a mobile phone, for example. So that is, again, a very complex issue that's very different in the United States than it is from uh, other places. Very well said. Thank you, Sarah. James, last words? Oh, uh, so <laughs> uh, just to go back quickly to the, to the question. Um, Blockchain wasn't invented in 2008, 2009. It's, it was a concept that was thought about and came through in uh, PhD paper, uh, doctorates in uh, UK, Cal Berkeley uh, in the 1970s. The idea of uh, information stored openly, cryptographically protected by a key where you, everyone could view, uh, but only, act, only move by, by having that private key, A, uh, and B, um, making it so that everybody could share and see everybody else's information as part of the system uh, and have the information protected by being serially built so that each block has the same as the previous block so you could always authenticate the non-transmutability. Those were concepts that, that came from Cal Berkeley. And, uh, I, and then you know, if you look at all the technology that blockchain is built upon, was generated by the US government. So it's all mostly DARPA. Uh, you know, technology in terms of cryptography, uh, et cetera. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of theories about who it is, but, but Bitcoin was specifically built so that you wouldn't know who the, who the founder was, because the whole idea is for it to be very much like our internet system, to be a system that could survive cutting off the head and still behave, you know, uh, accurately and faithfully. Um, so, so intentionally, Bitcoin's, you know, founders are not are not uh, disclosed. Um, uh, and I think that as a closing piece, um, uh, I would just always watch the causal arrow. Humans get confused as to which direction cause actually flows. And what's happening to us now in terms of decentralization and distributed ledger uh, and you know Web3, this is not about technology changing people. People are staying the same. It's all the same problems, it's all the same people, it's fear and greed, right, is what drives people. Uh, and so, and boom and bust, you know, that's just what, how people work. And this is just the next iteration of that. So be careful when you hear people saying that Bitcoin's changing the world, it's the root of the evil, or et cetera. You know, what's really happening is that humanity is searching for a change. We're always looking for change, we're attracted to change, and sometimes we actually need change. Right? And I think what's happening now is this is a tool that's available that kind of fits in the kind of changes that we need just to get the people who are in power to consider alternatives uh, and to actually have the threat of an alternative, which I think is very positive for us in society. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank the really a terrific panel for a wonderful conversation. Um, Paul, have a good night in Paris. Thanks again for being here with us. Thank you. And thank you as well to the World Affairs Council for hosting us and for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you. If your head hurts, I verified there are still some cookies in the back after <laughs> absorbing all of this. Thank you all for that dynamic discussion and thank you all for the good questions from the audience. We've got some future interns in this industry that will follow up with you. And if you need an estate planning attorney, the folks at Buchanan Ingersoll can help you out as well.
Uh, thank you to our partners on this, Buchanan Ingersoll, and our venue host, the Racquet Club of Philadelphia, and our nonprofit partner, the Asian American Chamber of Commerce of Greater Philadelphia. We've got three more programs coming up in, in October. Uh, we have a World Affairs Table in Mexico on October 13th. We'll talk about foreign affairs and also host a mezcal tasting and have a Mexico culinary tasting with the chef of Condesa on the 13th. On October 24th, we'll have a Diplo chat. It's just what it sounds. It's an intimate, off-the-record conversation with a diplomat, this time featuring Ambassador Huang Ping from the People's Republic of China. And on October 26th, we'll have a fireside chat with Philadelphia's own Chris Matthews. He's got a new book out called This Country, and it's his perspective about where we've been and where we're going. With that, thank you on behalf of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. We look forward to seeing you again. You will receive an email with a request for a survey. The more feedback you give us, the better programs we can make available to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.